What UFO encounters did the Soviet communist government suppress? Today, I'll cover three of the most startling UFO cover-ups from the Soviet era. On September 13, 1990, a military radar station in the Volga Ural region of the USSR picked up a large object in the sky. It appeared suddenly, and at the time it was detected, it was almost overhead. As the radar was tasked with detecting aircraft that could be bombers or missiles, the signal was taken very seriously. But as quickly as the object was detected, it disappeared from their radar. Because of the proximity of the craft and its unusual disappearance, the commander of the installation, Major Tuplin, and others in his team went outside to look for the aircraft with binoculars. What they saw stunned them. Overhead was a triangular object hovering in the air. Later, it was estimated that each side was about 50 feet long. That's about the length of a four-story building. It was entirely black. No windows or portals were visible. Then, as the incredulous soldiers watched, the craft shot three bright lights into the sky before landing nearby. What prompted the next events is unknown. Was the object reacting to the soldiers or executing a pre-planned move? But another beam of light came from the craft, this time aimed at an antenna from the radar installation. The antenna reportedly caught fire. Surprised, the soldiers fired their rifles at the now landed object, only to be stopped by their commander. Then began a standoff of sorts. The object didn't move for an hour, and the soldiers and radar technicians kept their distance, warily watching and waiting. But during this pause, Tuplin realized that two soldiers had gone missing, Corporal Blazis and Private Varenza. The standoff ended as suddenly as it began with the object rising up and disappearing into the sky. Later, the two missing soldiers were found and confused at why their comrades were concerned about them. Their watches were stopped, but they had no idea that they had been missing the whole time. They claimed that they had never left their posts, and oddly, their serial numbers on their weapons had also been removed. The event, of course, had to be investigated. The object had been seen by too many soldiers to simply ignore. Initially, a reporter from the Zarodinia newspaper, the official publication of the military district, started to look into the events. Then, before the arrival of a Soviet UFOologist, Igor Barin, the investigation was shut down by the chief air defense officer for the region. The matter was dropped and the witnesses told to move on. This case, like many others of the Soviet time, were dismissed outright. The facts, whether they led to a scientific rationale for the events or their cause remained unknown, were buried. As a result, some of the most famous UFO encounters from the USSR have only come to light in the last few decades since the fall of that evil empire. While most UFO encounters are shrouded with uncertainty, doubt, and confusion anyway, the communist government instilled fear, suppressing the population's will to report sightings and researchers' willingness to investigate them. We should never be fearful of respectful debate. It's only totalitarians who want to make discussion impossible and control speech. In this episode, we'll visit some of the most fascinating Soviet UFO cases that aren't often in the discussion. Hi, I'm M.F. Thomas, and this is My Dark Path, where we explore conspiracies, the paranormal, and the unexplained. there are thousands of reports of UFOs in Russia that predated the Soviet Union. While those events were of mild interest to the Soviet authorities at best, World War II marked the moment when UFOs moved from a curiosity to a national security concern. While Stalin and Hitler formed an alliance early in the war, only to be broken later by Germany, reports of UFOs reached a fever pitch as flying anomalies were observed as military aircraft flooded the skies with human eyes and the Soviet military started taking these reports very seriously. One of the events that caught the attention of the Soviet government is today captured in a report from the Russian Ufology Research Center. 
It details an encounter in the skies over Poland in the fall of 1944. A navigator aboard a Soviet bomber, Lev Petrovich Auschwitzer, observed a peculiar bright object over an airfield near the front lines near Warsaw. Lev and many others in the plane saw an object hovering or maintaining its altitude for about 15 minutes, a feat that drew everyone's attention. Equally surprising was the object's brightness. Then, without warning, the object flew straight up at an alarming speed before disappearing from sight. Soviet flight crews knew nothing of the Foo Fighters that were the subject of much discussion among Western flight crews, but the event prompted Lev to start collecting reports from other military pilots about their UFO sightings. Another prominent sighting took place in August of 1943 at the location of a fierce armor battle at Kursk, a city near the Russian border with Ukraine. It was here that Soviet and German tanks and artillery fought. In this case, the UFO observation was made from the ground. Senior Lieutenant Gennady Zelaganov was watching the sky in the aftermath of a Soviet artillery attack on German lines. At this moment, a sickle-shaped object came into view. If you recall, there was a spate of sickle-shaped UFOs that were viewed throughout the Soviet Union in the 1950s, but in the middle of World War II, this was not a shape typically associated with UFO sightings. The object flew incredibly fast and quickly disappeared from the surprised lieutenant's view, but the object had been close enough for Gennady to make out the color of the UFO. It had been dark blue, except for the middle that was bright orange. In the book, The Soviet UFO Files, Gennady is reported as describing the object as something like the breathing of a giant dolphin as the center appeared to expand and contract in size. And he was not alone in his sighting as others signed the report as well. And this was not the only UFO sighting at the epicenter of the Kursk battlefront. There were other reports of a massive UFO that hovered over the ground between the Soviet and German lines staying in place just before the commencement of the battle. Soviet leaders feared that this might have been another Nazi wonder weapon. While the V-1 and V-2s had been deployed against the Allies in the West, wild rumors persisted of other Nazi superweapons. Observers made several drawings of the object that were supposedly placed in Felix Ziegel's archive. But today, no such drawings are to be found in Ziegel's records. Ziegel's friend, Burdikov, was very familiar with the contents of his archives, but he never saw any records of these events at Kursk. But beyond the battlefield, Soviet citizens were also making wartime UFO observations. For example, earlier in the war in April of 1941, a young high school-age student named Shurakova was at home in a village north of Stalingrad. About 11 p.m., she observed several red and black globes hovering over the nearby forest. Reportedly, the objects were the size of the setting sun. After watching them briefly, they started moving in a way that suggested to her that they were fighting, eventually causing one to try to escape a potential dogfight and fly south while gaining altitude. The other gave chase and seemingly shot down the escaping object. The object crashed on the Zelini Island on the River Don. Civilians nearby reported hearing a loud boom that night. Now, the morning after the crash, several locals went to investigate. At this time, there was no bridge to the island, so the civilians used mobile pontoon bridges to visit it. To their surprise, they found a crashed object with pieces scattered broadly around the point of impact. Shards of silver metal covered the terrain. The civilians observed that the object had broken apart into several large and small sections, with some partially buried in the earth. Perhaps even more shocking was that, throughout the wreckage, they found remnants of several bodies. In hindsight, these were presumably alien in origin. As word reached the government, the island and surrounding area soon swarmed with soldiers and secret police. Rumors ripped through the area about what was found, only to be exacerbated by the observation that trucks were seen hauling things away from the area. Reportedly, a laboratory was built right on the site to study the crash. 
Initially, the craft was thought to be a new German spy airplane or even a V-1 or V-2. But at this time, the Soviet and Nazi governments were allies, and so the Soviet government may have even reinforced this rumor as a test gone wrong. Apparently, the investigation stretched on for months, but several facts seemed to emerge. First, the craft was large, between 20 and 30 meters in diameter. Additionally, the wreck and ground around the crash were contaminated with radiation. But as the effects of radiation were poorly understood, its presence was not initially picked up. But many who visited or worked at the crash or even evaluated the debris died from radiation poisoning, leaving few witnesses. Just two months after the crash, the Nazis invaded their ally on June 22, 1941, diverting Soviet attention entirely to their Western Front. And six months later, on November 20, 1941, German troops reached the area. A regiment of the NKVD, the Soviet Army, fiercely defended the island, including the laboratory that had continued to operate there. But as their defenses crumbled, the Soviet troops evacuated the area and lab, taking with them the remaining wreckage, reportedly to the distant city of Novosibirsk, far from the front lines. Again, the radiation from the wreckage was severe, reportedly killing most of those involved in the evacuation. This purported crash and recovery became a footnote amid the horrors of war. And as I worked to try to verify parts of this event, I found several facts from a few different sources. Reportedly, in the 1980s, city leaders in Rostov-on-Don decided to make Zelini Island, today also known as the Green Island, into a center for youth development by building camps, sport fields, and parks. There are different stories about the results of this construction. Some sources say the construction was halted almost immediately without any explanation given. However, as I've looked into the island, it appears to be fully populated with housing, small businesses, and parks. Internet research provides no evidence that there's any residual radiation or other contamination. So how much evidence is there for this entire event? As usual, there's very little direct evidence of a UFO crash. Nevertheless, given the importance of the island to the story, could the island itself provide some additional proof? First, in favor of the story, there's no argument that an NKVD regiment was virtually wiped out. A record from the chief of staff of the 56th Army states, quote, the regiment fought fierce battles for the island where the enemy directed the most violent blows. Despite the obvious superiority of the enemy in forces, firepower, as well as favorable conditions of the area, the regiment courageously and stubbornly defended the area. The regiment's losses, killed and wounded, amounted to more than 90%, end quote. And there's another source that somewhat supports this story. The island has seemingly been the location of many paranormal events for some period of time, many that predate the purported UFO crash. Some stories claim the island has a pagan temple, and others state that the island has a source of energy that has attracted witches to the area to test their evil powers. And, well, a third source of evidence is simply the lack of evidence. The island is populated and has no records of unusual health problems. As I mentioned, there are parks, businesses, and ongoing human activity. So, like most UFO sightings, this event will remain unsolved, at least for the time being. But the event, combined with so many others in wartime USSR, only fed the already paranoid Soviet leadership paranoia that these sightings were actually Nazi or Western weapons, or, as we will see later in this episode, that the UFO and alien threat might, just might, be real. My novel, Arcade, is more than just a sci-fi thriller. It's an exploration of what happens when the technology that we depend on suddenly disappears. Fans of Ready Player One, Alien, and Interstellar will find familiar elements here. A collapsed society, mysterious alien forces, and a fight for survival against overwhelming odds. But at its core, Arcade is about the unbreakable bonds of family and the lengths we'll go to protect those we love. Kirkus Reviews called Arcade a confident sci-fi thriller that deftly addresses themes of resilience, faith, and the value of video games. Here's a quick synopsis. 
Explosions around the globe generate electromagnetic pulses that destroy every piece of technology using electronic circuits. Silicon Valley is not immune to the chaos that erupts. In the ruins of the world's technology hub, society's remnants focus on survival. In the final days before these changes, retired FBI agent Walter Jackson pursues his estranged wife and daughter from Memphis to the Bay Area. His return home now impossible, Walter survives by working for the local police while still seeking his family. He discovers a high-tech company that still operates with food, power, and a mission that reaches far beyond our solar system. Its leader, Sloan Holt, is also driven by the need to recover a loved one. Walter and Sloan collaborate, but other dangers put them at risk, from an industrialist who sees opportunity in the chaos to unknown forces from an alien world. The game of survival is being played out in an apocalyptic arcade. Many years ago, when I was planning my first trip to Geneva for work, I had a mental picture of the city that was informed more by fiction than by fact. For many reasons, most tied to popular culture, Geneva has a reputation as the epicenter of secret agents, diplomatic intrigue, and geopolitical power. Built on the shores of Lake Geneva, it's a historic location. And so while James Bond, Jason Bourne, or their real-world counterparts may not be leaping from rooftop to rooftop, It is also a city of intrigue. While the Soviets actively suppressed investigations of UFO activity at home, their government did not fully ignore it. While Burdikov and Ziegel were being dissuaded from investigating, the Ministry of Defense created a UFO research committee in 1955 that operated in secret. A year later, there's a report that the heads of the intelligence services of the USSR, Great Britain, USA, and France meeting in Geneva. Supposedly, they reached an agreement regarding how they would handle UFO reports. A part of their plan was focused on suppressing reports or finding ways to dismiss them altogether. In particular, the group wanted to minimize the UFO phenomenon and planned to enroll the media and the military, scientific, and medical resources as well. Alarmingly, they also wanted to infiltrate UFO research groups even to the point of taking leadership roles to subvert the mission of those organizations. Now, Soviet participation in this group, if it actually existed, was a part of the secret communist plan response to the potential threat of UFOs and an alien invasion. Some actual evidence of this comes from Ivan Vasilievich, a former KGB officer who visited UFOologist Yuri Stroganov in 1994. Reportedly, Vasilievich knew of Stroganov's efforts to share previously suppressed UFO research from the now defunct USSR. Vasilievich had been a part of a small secret planning team that had been charged by Khrushchev to develop options for responding to an alien invasion. The KGB group took as fact that an invasion was inevitable. Now, sometimes conspiracy theorists take this approach as government knowledge of the existence of UFOs and aliens, But a thoughtful reader must also recognize the following. To explore fully the potential outcomes of a scenario, like in this case of an alien invasion, the group has to accept that these conditions are true. So, while we may want to believe, this expectation isn't a signal of fact, but only a signal that the Soviet government thought the risk was real, or at least worth studying. The KGB group's charter was to determine the strategy and tactics to deal with an alien invasion. But first the group worked through the form of the attack. The team came to the conclusion that the invasion might not be in the form of total war, a scenario played out in H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. Instead, they explored the idea that an invasion would probably come in the form of a single alien ship, likely damaged or lost, that would crash on Earth and then initiate aggressive action. So under this scenario that the KGB team detailed, the invasion would easily be defeated, potentially with the use of weapons of mass destruction. Another scenario considered that aliens would be so advanced that they wouldn't even notice the human population and would be imperceptible to humans as well. Ultimately, the KGB team decided that the likely form of an invasion would play out under the following. 
The attack would be imperceptible at first, likely changing human DNA and culture without the human race even being aware of the invasion. But ultimately, the alien effort would undermine human civilization and place it under alien control. Now, this scenario seemed to drive Soviet policy. The idea that the Soviet government needed to detect alien craft and potential agents. Perhaps this policy was adopted simply because it was already a central principle of the Soviet state and arguably a core competency. It's an interesting thought exercise to ask. What if the right policy was to endorse freedom and individual accountability? Would it have been adopted? But back to the actual policy and its implementation. As an example, it turns out that the data gathered by all Soviet satellites was sent to a KGB unit for the purpose of looking for unidentified flying objects. Further, if an object was identified, the KGB unit would come up with options to track and potentially capture the object. Vasilevich worked for decades in the unit before it was finally disbanded by Gorbachev in 1985. He told Stroganov that during the time he served, the team tracked many objects in near Earth orbit that would be visible one moment, but then simply vanish a moment later. But one final thought about Gorbachev and Geneva and UFOs. During the 1985 Geneva summit, President Ronald Reagan and Soviet Premier Mikhail Gorbachev paused their negotiations to take a walk. They were accompanied only by their private interpreters. The details of their discussion were kept secret for years from both the American and Soviet public. But in a 2009 interview held by Charlie Rose and Reagan's Secretary of State George Shultz, Gorbachev revealed an odd question that Reagan had asked him during their stroll. Gorbachev recounted the following, quote, President Reagan suddenly said to me, what would you do if the United States were suddenly attacked by someone from outer space? Would you help us? And I said, no doubt about it. And Reagan said, we too, end quote. Gorbachev concluded that part of the story simply by saying, so that's interesting. Indeed, very interesting. No exploration of the secret Soviet UFO files can be complete without a review of an event that some call the Soviet Roswell. Dalnagorsk is a small mining town of about 35,000 residents on the east coast of today's Russia. It's about 50 minutes from the ocean. And to be clear, that's the east coast of Russia, the one that borders Japan. And to give you a sense of distance, a drive from Moscow to Dalnagorsk would be over 5,700 miles long. A flight with a connection would take over 12 hours. That's about the same flight time as a trip from the Atlanta airport where I'm riding this in Tokyo. But from the northern island of Japan, Dalnagorsk is just a few hundred miles away. The town itself was founded in 1897 by a Swiss immigrant, Julius Brenner. His son, Boris, maintained the right to mine in the town until 1931, making it one of the longest running private companies in the Soviet Union. Julius and Boris probably maintained this independence in part due to their distance from the core of Soviet power. Julius was born in La Roche, Switzerland, which is a town near the eastern tip of Lake Geneva. I passed near it on a few train rides, but never visited. He left his home in Switzerland as a teenager, took a ship to Shanghai, China, and then to Yokohama, Japan, where he started a shipping company that ultimately took him across the Sea of Japan to Vladivostok and the founding of the Dalnagorsk mining town. Julius's grandson was born to Boris and Marussia Brinner on July 11, 1920 in Vladivostok, Russia, his parents named him Yule. This is the same Yule who made his way to France and then ultimately New York, the same Yule who added an N to his last name, and the same Yule who won an Academy Award for Best Actor in 1956. This is the same Yule who's best known for his role as the King of Siam in The King and I. He was iconically recognized for his rich voice, bald head, and arresting screen presence, Yule Brenner. But back to UFOs, and the town that Julius founded, and an event that started about 7.55 p.m. on January 29, 1986. Winter weather is brutal in Dalnagorsk, and in January, the highs reach only 19 degrees Fahrenheit, and the lows average just one degree. 
That evening, a red object flew across the town from the southeast and crashed into a nearby mountain, which is also known as Hill 611, named for its height. The UFO reportedly flew noiselessly and parallel to the ground. Witnesses state that it was approximately three meters in diameter and had a perfectly round shape. There were no cavities or projections visible, and the red color was described as similar to that of burning stainless steel. One eyewitness, V. Kandikov, described the speed as being quite slow, only about 15 meters per hour. That's barely a mile an hour. Hardly a typical aircraft or meteorite. Kadnikov noted that the object slowly ascended and descended, and its red color intensifying only when it rose. As it approached Hill 611, he said the object jerked and fell to earth like a rock. All the eyewitnesses recalled similar behavior, remembering that the object jerked or jumped. Most said that it jerked twice. Two young girls thought that the object actually jerked four times before hurtling to the ground. And when the object crashed into Hill 611, the witnesses heard a thump and then observed an intense fire on the hill. Dr. Valery Vuzhilny, a leader of the Far Eastern Committee for Anomalous Phenomenon, was the first on the scene, arriving two days after the crash. While the area was blanketed with snow, the crash site was on a rocky ledge and was now clear of snow. Locals had already visited the site. When Dr. Vuzhilny and his team finally arrived, it was immediately evident to them that something had, in fact, crashed there. A burned-out tree stump smoldered still at the edge of the ledge, and it emitted an odd, chemical-like smell. The ground was littered with splintered rocks that showed evidence of being exposed to high temperatures. Some observers state that the lack of large pieces of the craft speak against the crash theory. However, in some instances, we know of airplane crashes that occur with such force that there remain no identifiable pieces. But different types of debris were scattered around the crash site. Some of the debris had the appearance of mesh. An examination of the mesh showed that it was made of tiny fibers, and again, these fibers made of even thinner ones. And these fibers were found to be woven with gold strands as well. Other objects strewn around had the appearance of tiny balls and others that looked like small pieces of glass. The tiny balls were reminiscent of droplets and were between 2 and 5 millimeters each in diameter. They could only be cut with a diamond blade saw, making the investigators believe that they must be manufactured. The droplets were made of nickel, chromium, and aluminum. All the debris was collected and analyzed by Soviet scientists at different branches of the Soviet Academy of Sciences. Reportedly, none of the items collected were able to be manufactured by processes known to people today. A. Kulikov, an expert on carbon at the Chemistry Institute of the Far Eastern Department of the Academy of Sciences, wrote about the mesh. He said that it was impossible to understand how the mesh was made. He noted that it appeared to be glass carbon, What puzzled the scientists was that after different items were melted in a vacuum, that the element molybdenum was seemingly created from nowhere. But as confusing as the origin of these items might be, scientists were confident in one fact. The presence of ash at the crash site confirmed that something biological had burned as a result of the crash. But what that might have been remains a topic of great speculation to this day. Now, immediately, some hypothesized that the cause of the crash could be tied to a launch originating from the Chinese Cosmodrome nearby. This facility frequently launched satellites into orbit, and their flight paths took them over the town of Dalnagorsk. But this potential cause was quickly eliminated as a quick check of the schedule confirmed that the Chinese conducted no launches around this period. Then, on February 8, 1986, just eight days after the crash on Hill 611, Something astonishing happened. At 8.30 p.m., two additional UFOs in the form of yellow spheres flew from the north to the south. Eyewitnesses saw these spheres circle the crash site four times. Then they turned back, flying north before disappearing. The crash seemed to create a zone of anomalies that remained active for up to three years afterward. Like the stories of the alien crash at the Green Island, the stories of these anomalies are varied, Reportedly, insects avoid the place. Mechanical and electronic equipment malfunction or fail altogether, and visitors to the hill get sick. 
And then about 20 months after the crash on Hill 611, another unusual event occurred. On November 28, 1987, near midnight, 32 flying objects appeared and were observed by hundreds of civilians as well as military personnel. People in 12 towns and settlements observed the UFOs, and 13 of them flew over Dalnagorsk and the crash site. Allegedly, three of them maintained a position over the town while five UFOs lit up Hill 611. The UFOs were completely quiet and were thought to maintain a relatively low altitude, no higher than a half a mile. Initially, the eyewitnesses thought the lights were search aircraft responding to some disaster or potentially meteorites. But as they passed overhead, their presence seemed to disrupt communications, including television reception. What is interesting is that the witnesses observed UFOs in two different forms. While some saw spheres like the one that crashed or swarmed the area a week after the crash, others saw massive cylindrical and cigar-shaped craft. For example, officers from the Ministry of Internal Affairs saw a red sphere with a dull finish with flame shooting behind it. A kindergarten teacher also saw a sphere-shaped UFO. It hovered over a school and emitted a blue light to the ground. It was completely quiet. Other groups saw the cylindrical UFOs that night. Workers at a nearby quarry saw a giant cylinder, massive in length, between 600 and 800 feet long. It moved slowly, but noiselessly. Managers at the site also saw this ship. The front part of it was reportedly brightly lit, like burning metal. So what are we to make of this Soviet Roswell at Dalnagorsk? Dr. Vazilny, the person closest to the investigation, came to the following conclusion. He believes that an alien spacecraft malfunctioned and then crashed into Hill 611. A second but related hypothesis is that an alien spacecraft malfunctioned nearly crashed on Hill 611, but skimmed the hilltop, leaving debris but ultimately crashing much farther away. The Dalnagorsk incident, like the others we've covered in this episode, have some facts that make them potentially authentic UFO encounters. Yet they also suffer from a flaw that, no matter how compelling the evidence, it's woven throughout the UFO cases we know of. The evidence is simply not 100% definitive. But my attitude remains the same. I still want to believe. And therefore, we keep searching for the truth. Thank you for joining me in this episode of My Dark Path. I'm M.F. Thomas, the creator and host. If you enjoyed what you just saw, please like the video and subscribe. And we'll see you next week as we walk the dark paths of the world together. In the meantime, my friends, good night. Good night.